Take it away. All right. Um, so today I'm going to cover unsupervised learning, last chapter of the book. So pretty excited for that. Uh, so the book didn't really cover too, too much outside these four techniques. Um, dimensionality reduction with principal component analysis and three different clustering techniques. Uh, and at the end of the book, they do talk about how to treat certain variables, whether it's uh, scaling them or uh, treating categorical variables as one hot encoder, blah, blah, blah. But I didn't think they were too important because they were already covered in the previous chapter. So maybe we'll cover it if we have time at the end. Uh, that being said, uh, unsupervised learning is essentially uh, extracting insights from data without training for a specific outcome. Um, and then, yeah, like I mentioned before, two main cases are reduction in clustering, um, which can reveal insights into the data or relationship between variables. Uh, I think, John, you posted a really good picture a little earlier. Um, let's see if I can pull that up. Say, This right here, like if you're thinking of a y and x axis, think of which way the whale is going to eat the most shrimps. And if the shrimps line up this way, that's the most variability. So you, the whale will go for that. But uh, if if the shrimps were uh, indeed x axis, uh, the y axis, the perpendicular to it, will be the second most variability. Uh, so that's in essence what PCA does. And I think um, if you uh, open up the tweet, the second tweet in that thread is really, oh, really? illustrates it really well. Yeah. Wow. And I love it because she talks about, uh, just click the Twitter. Yeah. yeah. She, she does this in class and likes to watch everyone uh, be a whale shark. And so if we just scroll down a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> so then, you know, oh, how That's do you great. get the most? And she watches everyone in class tilt their head. So. <laughs> Yeah, this is PCA. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, that's a better version of this graph that I found here. Um, but it, in essence, PCA seeks to represent uh, many different variables into a smaller set by turning them into a, a linear combination of those variables. And uh, they use covariance to find the most variability in the full data set. Um, the result is these weights that, you know, basically tell the data how to transform themselves into a principal component. And I've got some uh, screen captures from Julia Silge's blog. Um, uh, we, to interpret these in our principal components, we can use a chart that plots every single PC loading weights uh, in the uh, value here uh, across different variables, the original variables, to see what the data tells you. So this particular data set was on hip hop songs and their various attributes on Spotify. Uh, so the principal component one, the most variability in this data com comes from newer songs that are up-tempo, loud, and no danceability, uh, and so on. So I like, this is almost like an exploratory data analysis that you uh, do without even uh, to understand the data set. Um, and then you can you can look at a scree plot to see how much of the variability the each of the principal components covered within the data set. Um, one thing I did want to ask the group is since they're the P, uh, principal components are uncorrelated with each other, uh, do they ever go up over one hundred percent if you add these all up? I I'm. I'm not sure if that works out. Jonathan's done a lot looking into this. I was wondering if he could answer I, that. I don't, yeah, I don't think they would. I mean, if you calculate <laughs> the variability in a, what I think is like a natural way, then it adds to 100. Yeah, I think so. Um, I mean, I guess technically with a rounding, it could go above, but other other than that, it wouldn't. Right. I just wanted to point out that it really bothered me that they said that this is called a scree plot because it looks like a scree slope, as if everyone knows what the word scree means. I like, certainly it, wouldn't have until like, I, I, recently. <laughs> yeah, I searched. I, I found that it's like the the gravelly slope at the bottom of a mountain is a scree slope. 
okay. <laughs> you know, like I had to go look that up because I I, th- I was offended by their definition. Oh, it looks like a scree slope. Got it. I think most people think, uh, at least in, in this kind of group, we don't understand what a scree slope is because it looks like a scree plot, right? Right, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so I wanted to. So if you can scroll back up a minute uh, to those those principal components there. So thinking about, I mean, so I just I've only read up to like the uh, the PCA and the clustering part of the chapter. So I'm thinking in terms of those two algorithms here, right? So like um, for the weights for the PCA here, this is defining not like not clusters, not particular songs, but axes along which songs most vary, right? right. So like the first one, PC1, which has big positive weight for year, uh, big negative weight for danceability. This is saying that the most variation, if I just focus on those two, also val- uh, valence, I don't even know what that means in terms of like hip hop songs. But anyway, yeah, I... <laughs> okay. So if we just think, like year and danceability, I mean, it, it's saying like along those, along that axis is the most variability in the songs. So there's a negative correlation between year and danceability. Now, I don't, I don't know sort of where along that axis, like the, there's the most, but songs, what I interpret that as saying is songs that came out, I guess most recently for having high value of year, have a relatively low value of danceability. So we think about that, that cluster of shrimp, like the, it's mostly along this, this axis, um, that direction, right? Like, I don't wanna, I don't, I don't wanna think about this in terms of like, oh, the, the first principal component is a cluster of particular songs. No, it's a direction along which all songs have the most variability. Yes, Am I... I think so. Okay. Yeah. The way your data and, lies, there's a big... Right, exactly. Like the shrimp, right? You know, the shrimp. Yeah. The main yeah, body. Yeah, negative slope. Okay. Um, so yeah, and the book uh, tells you, you know, usually the first one to five-ish components cover the most variability. And once you go uh, past that, it's really not that much variability that explained by those. Um, so yeah, this is PCA, a uh, really good tool for uh, EDAs, or even uh, you can do a regression with those PCs. Um, but yeah, that's principal components. Uh, K-means clustering. I wasn't able to put this GIF in this R markdown, but uh, um, basically, I'll, I'll show you the GIF first. Um, so it's here. <laughs> right, so there's your data, and then you pick two random, in this case, uh, points in the data, and then you assign every single record in your data set to one of those two clusters. And once you've done that, there's a new mean to each clusters. And then using those means, you kind of repeat the same process over and over again until the clusters mean don't really change too much. That's when you stop. I, I don't know if I explained that properly, but that's in a sense how K-means algorithm works. So these are the steps. Uh, choose a random K, uh, user-defined K cluster that you want to define your data into. Uh, and then go through these steps repeatedly until uh, they're all clustered. One thing I did want to uh, point out, though, is that the algorithm is not guaranteed to find the best possible solution, and there's no optimal uh, way to get the K. Um, so the book just says uh, run, the, run these like four or five times, and then you'll get a decent, uh, some, some kind of a uh, standard. But has anyone had any experience with K-means, what's the best, the best practices? Uh, not more like I think what the book says is kind of accurate in that it's you got to kind of you know like you know you do the the um, elbow plot like they talk about and sometimes it's clear 
but I I was like I went back and forth on what I thought about their example of plot. Like it'd be nice to show one that actually works, but it's also nice to show that a lot of times it doesn't work. That you're just de- deciding where the, your elbow is. Um, but there are times where you know you've got a few plots and or a few points, and then it's like flat. And so adding more K's or adding using a higher K doesn't help. Um, but it, it's so it's very data and task specific. So it's hard to say. Like it is valid that a lot of times you're looking at it and going, well, I want to find about five clusters. Um, so there's a trade-off of keeping the clusters meaningful but not getting too many clusters and not having too few clusters. And there's, you know, all that goes into it. So there isn't usually an easy way to, um, you can't hand off the decision to math, I guess is what it comes down to. Like, I've I've only done this, I think in cases where I like, I kind of see the the plot already. And, you know, I can, I kind of know where I want the clusters to be (laughs) ish. Uh, so actually, I mean, that's maybe like thinking about this in, in combination with PCA, you know, one of the good things for useful things for PCA is it helps you visualize high dimensional data because you can reduce it down to two or three dimensions, which can be plotted. So if you do your clustering on something and then also visualize it using PCA and see where the clusters are, like I've only done this in in cases where I can visually check and say, yep, like that looks right. <laughs> yeah. And then as far as the, the like rerunning it, um, I think a lot of the idea there is if your clusters come out drastically different each time you rerun it with a different seed, then your clusters probably aren't meaningful. Like, even uh, I, I found though that it won't come out drastically different every single time. Like even if they're not well-defined clusters, there's only going to be a handful of likely endpoints, and it will yeah. fall into one of those. So I would say if it if it's different every time, then you pretty definitely don't have real clusters. If it's the same every time, you might have real clusters. <laughs> so yeah. I don't know. Anyone else yeah. have any thoughts on that? All right. Okay. <laughs> um, so yeah, interpreting clusters. Um, you're basically trying to tell: is it going to new work? Is it going to work with the new data that I'm going to feed in later? Um, so sizes and uh, means of the clusters are important. Um, and one really good example I found of uh, k-means uh, use case of k-means is. Uh, contracts in sports you know you, you throw in a bunch of stats together uh if you're a uh, free agent or something you find similar players of your playing style and then see how much they got paid and then so hey at least i deserve this much or marketing clustering like cl- uh, clustering your customers into uh predefined three k's because you only have three people working something like that um so yeah those would be the use cases and then there's hierarchical clustering, which is, which was pretty confusing at first. But once you dive into the steps, it becomes a little more clear. Um, so you define a distance metric, uh, usually a Euclidean, or you can use a goers the distance at the end of the book, um, and a dissimilarity metric, which is very important because they tell you how to define clusters and see uh, uh, how to step away from a cluster, I guess. So how it works is you assign every single record as an individual cluster, like at the bottom here, I got a bunch of countries uh, being clustered together by uh, their dissimilarity. Um, Calculate all pairwise um, distance of all records and using uh, some sort of a dissimilarity metric, one of four, you calculate the distance between all pairs of clusters and the least dissimilar clusters are added together. So let's say France and Finland were uh, the least dissimilar in the first round. And so they get clustered together. And whenever there's a horizontal line intersecting a vertical line, that's a cluster. Um, And then you continue on with the merging until there's uh, one cluster at the end. 
uh, dendrograms are useful because it tells you how variables are, how, how far away these are uh, from the others. So maybe Finland is really far away from Luxembourg. Um, yeah, that's hierarchical clustering. I don't think the book covered too, too much other than uh, going into the dissimilarity metrics, which on page, Three oh nine. So the default is complete linkage, which is the max distance of all pairs between a cluster A and B. Um, but there's other greedy methods like uh, uh, minimum, so single linkage. It just looks for minimum distance between all pairs of records. Um, so yeah, and depending on which dissimilarity metrics you use, uh, the clustering uh, results are really different on page three ten. Um, I was wondering if you could help me um, understand the the way this plot is drawn here with the height dimension here. I know it means something, but I'm trying. So I'm particularly looking at if you follow the Czech Republic uh, line up, yep, and that's that's grouped with Slovenia, and then there's the the line up there goes far, but then that. Yeah, if you're right above your mouse, it's like it's a very tight distance. So I wonder, I'm thinking about how do I interpret that height? Like I, I think greater height means there's like a greater dissimilarity between something. I'm just I'm trying to make sure I understand like what that means, especially as far as these different groups come together here. I think that's a distance between these clusters, so from Slovenia to Iran Islamic Republic, and comparing these clusters, Belize and Kyrgyzstan. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure, does anyone have a good idea? Like, I'm, like, I'm thinking this like- distance, right? This distance, right? This distance versus yeah. this distance. For example, I think Belize and St. Lucia are very similar by whatever metrics they're using. So the, the fork that's connecting those has very short yep. times. Um, but then that cluster of Belize and St. Lucia comparing Azerbaijan and the Kyrgyz Republic, uh, you know, there's the fork of the uneven times there, right? Like, I don't know. Like, <laughs> I, I kind of understand what's going on, but not well enough to like tell somebody. Like it. I always think of it. I don't know if it has more meaning, but it's just kind of the step when they were combined. Um, you know, like Belize and St. Lucia got combined before Azerbaijan and Kyrgyz Republic. Oh, okay. So that, so but, it's indicating that, yeah, they're, they're, they're similar though. Like yeah, they, because they, they were the most, because they got most, they get combined similar. first. Yeah, and Belize then it looks like Saint Suriname Lucia. and Iran looks second, probably. And I so I think no two things, eh, maybe they do. I, I don't, like they shouldn't, nothing should have the same height. I bet, but I mean, height isn't like, it's- It's a it's bad not, term. It's not like iteration, it's, it's something else. Like starts from zero and- Oh, well, the height there is dissimilarity. Because you're, yeah, you're measuring, you're measuring the two that are the least dissimilar, and exactly two. So you you do a merge, and then you repeat the algorithm, and then you do a, a single merge, and you repeat the algorithm. But you might have to go a long way in height before you get the next one, right? Like you know, you, you could have two that are really close, and then another one over here. Theoretically. <laughs> Okay, but that, that's, anyway. that's helpful. Like, I, I should read this plot in some ways from the ground up. <laughs> yes. Right? And, okay. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, you're, you're, you know, there is more distance between, like, up at the top, obviously. there. So yeah. it's not pure. It does have a meaning. <laughs> okay. So then, so then that, that, my original, like, right above South Africa, like, the cluster containing both South Africa and the Czech Republic that merges, and then very soon after that, 
that cluster merges with the one containing Belize and St. Lucia. Yeah. And okay, so it's okay. The that very small distance there is kind of saying this cluster here that got merged with this one is not okay. I can't put it in words, but I I'm, I'm <laughs> starting to cast it. <laughs> okay, good. That was helpful. Thanks. All right. Uh, last technique, model-based clustering. This was also very confusing, um, but essentially uh, you assume that all the variables come from some kind of a distribution and the books uh, really only covered multivariate normal distribution. So you're saying uh, all the variables come from one of K multivariate, um, multivariate normal distributions and they use the covariance matrix to kind of parameterize, uh, 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 fine tune, I guess, fine tune the covariance matrix uh, to find the best fitting uh, sets of distributions. I thought this was pretty dangerous because you're making a lot of assumptions, uh, um, but the book didn't really say anything else other than that. Um, but one good thing is you don't have to specify your K before because it does it automatically by maximizing uh, the BIC, and they don't scale well because you have to uh, tune a bunch of different uh, distributions into them. Uh, same with k-means and hierarchical. Um, but yeah, I was wondering if anyone could comment on this technique. Like, I, I don't really get too much out of this book uh, in terms of model-based clustering. The uh, the figure on page three sixteen, the plot just made me mad <laughs> like why even include that plot everything is over plotted even when they explain that these the vee veev and vve were the three uh top ones i i can't find them like i think i found them but it's hard to tell for sure if i'm looking at the ones that it's talking about and i just i that plot made me so mad <laughs> Come on, try harder. <laughs> like, use a bigger scale so they actually separate out or something. Um, other than that, like, and I guess that kind of reflects, I, I don't think they explained this stuff very well in this section. Um, it's like, well, we're at the end of the book. Let's just finish. <laughs> so that's yeah, my thoughts on it. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, if there's underlying assumptions that you know are true, I guess this is really useful because it does give a really different uh, outcome, like the clustering outcomes and the rest of the techniques. Uh, but without knowing those assumptions, I don't know how these techniques would be would be appropriate. I mean, isn't that the point of model-based clustering? Like, if you have a model that you have reason to believe is correct, or you have you know whatever confidence in then you can use that to put some order or interpretation on your data. But you're right. Like, I mean, if there's, that's the assumption you're starting with. Okay? Right. I have a model. And I didn't get to this section yet, but I'm assuming they don't like cover how to, how to get that model. Right. You're saying if you have a model. No, they, they have, uh, they have ones that, that like, um, selects different things to be important in clustering, uh, the mclust uh, method. Um, and they go into it a little bit, but the, I don't know, I don't think feel like it really explained it well enough to be a really useful technique. And I, I don't know, they even, they talk about that. People still mostly use k-means. Um, and I think a lot of these other ones are kind of like ways to better measure distance and then mostly do k-means. And so, you know, you're finding better ways to explain how far apart are things and then do something. Um, I don't know. I, I want to read more <laughs> about the model, model based clustering. But with a plot, I, I need to remake that plot and then just change the, the axis because it drives me crazy that I can't see what's in the plot. Um, 
so yeah so if no one has any other comments on the modal model based clustering that's about the four techniques that covers that's covered in the book and i guess since we have time scaling and categorical variables really simple um do scale your variables when you're doing a, a clustering or a pca um but even when you do so there are dominant variables there can be dominant variables that can throw off uh, uh, the meanings of your data. Um, so do use these with caution, I guess. That's what the book tells you really. Like they, right. they don't really uh, the, go into it much. The, the Gower's distance or Gower's distance, I'm not sure how that's pronounced, um, was, you know, that was an, an, a different thing. Like I, I, I felt like the scaling, um, the normalization part, they like pretty much repeated what was in the previous chapter and said, yeah, this is also useful for uh, the techniques here. But the Gower's distance actually went into um, something, you know, interesting. But then after they wrapped that up, they're like, but a lot of times really what you want to do is split by your categorical variable and then cluster. Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, but you can use Gower's distance for... Uh, hierarchical clustering distance metric, so which, yeah. is, which is kind of cool. Um, and that's it, really. It was a pretty short chapter. Um, yeah, thank you. <laughs>